first I want to uh, just, like everyone else, just have a moment to acknowledge uh, Richard, who, um, you know, you, most of you work in a field that uh, many people regard as important, and you do not need to be reminded that what you do is interesting. And uh, I have toiled in the fields of insurance, uh, <laughs> where I often have to uh, uh, come up with, euf with euphemisms to, to, to study what I do. And so it was just enormously validating uh, to have Richard decide that this, you know, very accomplished person in other uh, fields of investigation to decide that this was a field worth studying and to, uh, you know, be a uh, sort of intellectual collaborator. We never actually wrote anything together, but felt like a fellow traveler uh, in exploring this uh, field, which um, is I don't know, it's very omnipresent in our lives. I mean, if you look at what people spend their money on, uh, after their mortgage payment, uh, the thing that they spend their money, their next largest amount of money on is different kinds of insurance, and yet it's not um, studied at all. So um, I'm going to talk today um, about uh, a project that's in a, in a mid, midpoint, and it's the health insurance regulation and healthy behavior or health insurance as governance, picking up on Richard's uh, art title for his uh, first book that he did with Aaron and Dean Barry that's become now the name of a whole field of insurance as governance. Um, and the first part of the research is done, and I, I've written an article um, that I called Health Insurance Risk and Responsibility After the Affordable Care Act. And in that, in that article, I argued um, that the Affordable Care Act, which is the name of the, of the uh, law in the U.S. That, enact, that enacted the new health reformer, what the um, anti-people call Obamacare, um, that it embodies a new social contract uh, in the US uh, of solidarity through private ownership, markets, choice, and individual responsibility with government as the insurer for the elderly and the poor. Uh, and this new health uh, healthcare contract, social contract, extends what I call in that article the fair share approach to healthcare financing. And it's an approach that largely rejects the actuarial fairness vision of uh, what constitutes a fair share while pointing towards a new responsibility to be as healthy as you can. Uh, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. The new responsibility to be as healthy as you can reflects the influence of health economics and health ethics on the development of the legislation. And there's, I mean, the people, they had economists and ethicists <coughs> involved. Um, and also reflects our larger trend in uh, the approach to insurance and risk and responsibility that Jonathan and I uh, called embracing risk, which is an approach that is characterized by policies that embrace risk as an incentive that can reduce individual claims on collective resources. Um, these, po these policies include the shift from defined benefit to defined contribution pensions, uh, an ongoing shift from defined benefit to defined contribution health insurance, the employment context, uh, the political support for good driver discounts and automobile insurance, the effort to end welfare as we know it, uh, and a wide variety of other uh, efforts to increase risk bearing in uh, particularly the uh, commercial insurance market. And all these efforts represent, all these policies represent efforts to use risk spreading institutions to, govern, to encourage individuals to govern their own lives in a socially responsible manner. And, you know, in that, I'm hoping that people are hearing sort of Nick Rose governing the soul, this idea of responsabilization. Uh, and there's a certain irony to the use of a risk spreading institution to, 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 to put risk back on individuals so that they manage their lives in a socially responsible way. Um, now, the next, the thing I'm in the middle of doing, which is an empirical and theoretical investigation of this new responsibility to be as healthy as you can. Uh, while in many ways it's a laudable concept, it has a dark side that I did not adequately develop or explore in the first article. Um, and my fellow U.S. law professor, Wendy Mariner, wrote about this aspect of the dark side in an article she wrote called Social Solidarity and Personal Responsibility in Health Reform. And she, in that article, argued that uh, wellness programs, which are a key component of the responsibility to be as healthy as you can, um, Dis disadvantage those most in need of social assistance and therefore may unravel the social solidarity that prompted reform in the first place. I, in the 
earlier work responded in a kind of backhanded way that no, well, no, I, this wasn't about the responsibility to be healthy, which might do that. This is about the responsibility to be as healthy as you can, and that everyone can be as responsive, can be as healthy as they can, but <laughs> not everyone can be healthy. Um, but that was pretty lame response, and so, um, so now I'm, you know, atoning for that by. Um, by doing research on wellness programs. And, and wellness programs are really, I, I don't know about in other countries, but in the US, they're a really hot trend in, um, in employment-based health care and strongly encouraged by the Affordable Care Act. Um, so what I do is I want to tell you a little bit about the, the wellness programs um, and then to explore, to, to, uh, and I'm going to conclude that part by just really asserting that there is no, little or no empirical research that they do anything in terms of anything consequentialist and then to talk about why it is that they're nevertheless very, um, uh, very popular and growing. And my working hypothesis is that the ideas and aspirations that support wellness programs uh, really strongly resonate with the, the governmentality of responsibilization. Uh, and so therefore, they're adop adopted for that purpose. So I want to tell you what uh, wellness programs are. Um, you know, there are all the things that, that encourage you to do things that you probably think you should do, right? So there are health risk assessments. That's the kind of figuring out what it is that then we want people to reduce consumption on tobacco and alcohol, to engage in physical activity, good nutrition, stress management, to hit uh, body targets that are believed to be related to health. Um, BMI, body mass index, which I recently learned used to be called the Cadillac Index because it was developed by Adolf Cadillac. Um, very old. Um, uh, cholesterol measures, uh, blood pressure, we want people to engage in preventive health care, medical care like getting a flu shot, and to manage chronic conditions and, and diseases. A, uh, a thing that I'm just beginning to understand is how it is that, that when you set up a health a wellness program that either wants people to hit these targets or to engage in these activities, how do you monitor uh, what they how, whether people do these things. Um, and one interesting uh, tidbit that I have uh, discovered is that plenty of uh, employers do nothing. They, they, they have the program and they rely on it. And, and I talked to a guy who's a CEO of a medium-sized company that had just adopted a wellness program. And he said, based on the advice of their benefits consultant, they uh, just set up the program and they don't monitor what employees do other than to ask for self-reports. And I said, why? Uh, and he said two things. One is he says self-reports are way more reliable than you think because people are scared of insurance companies. And they think that insurance companies know much more than they do. Um, and so that's one thing. And then secondly, he said, and this I think is very revealing, is that he said, the benefits consultant said to me, we've got, you have this program to show that you want to help your employees. Not because it's really going to save big bucks. So why spend money on seeing whether they actually do it? <laughs> and and this, this is actually very important I'll come, 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 come back, back to. And, and, so it's and this is, for me, an illustration of why it's important to actually go out in the field, like Richard, of course, did, to find out what people are actually doing rather than what they're saying about it. Um, so here's some of the technologies of getting people to do the thing that they are promising to do. Um, one big uh, and area is, in the, is, a, is financial incentives. You will either have, to, depending on what the target is, if it's a BMI target or a cholesterol lowering target, or if it's simply getting a health risk assessment or attending a, uh, a, you know, going to the gym, you can either give people a discount on their health insurance premiums, you can give them a reward for participating, or you can penalize them for not participating. And these, you know, these all are similar economic things, but the way that they are framed is important. Uh, and one example, uh, Arizona recently announced uh, that it will be charging all of its Medicaid uh, members, and Medicaid is the, is the program for the poor in the US, um, $50 per year if they smoke um, or if they are obese. Um, so that's an example, that's, that, that's a penalty. Um, but is a 20% discount for someone who doesn't smoke, is that a, does that make a, you know, that's a discount or penalty. So um, what, as, as Wendy Mariner pointed out, these financial incentives have at least the potential to conflict with an anti-discrimination norm that is present in uh, health benefit, in actually all employ employment benefits, that in contrast to the notion of actuarial fairness in the insurance industry where it's fair to pay according to your risk, 
and any and actually p having two people who are of different risk levels paying the same price is discrimination. Um, that the uh, in the health sorry in the employment benefit context in the U.S. we have a, we have a legal requirement that all people pay the same price regardless of age. Um, or, 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 or health status. And, and wellness in, incentives for being, to doing, engaging in these well, wellness programs, for hitting these targets, uh, have at least the potential to, um, to amount to discrimination from this sort of civil rights perspective. Um, and so as a result, the wellness programs are explicitly permitted exception to the anti-discrimination norm. And the Affordable Care Act, in uh, sort of doubles down on that and allows companies to give people as much as half of the cost of the health insurance back to them for participating uh, in the program. Um, so we have financial incentives. We People are experimenting with social incentives. Um, there's been research on uh, getting people to engage in health risk assessments. Um, it's mostly at this point at the at the research, Dave, but some employers have um, experimented by doing things like recruiting the work group, but, you know, giving you more money, giving you a bigger payment if more people in your work group do it, uh, participate in the program. And other countries, uh, notably J Japan, have uh, done more to harness social incentives in the workplace to promote healthy behavior. And then the final, so we have financial incentives, social incentives, and then the final thing that is characteristic of these, of at least some of the programs, is uh, reduced barriers to health promoting services. So no cost sharing for preventive services or no cost sharing for disease, uh, for chronic disease management. And this is an aspect of a wellness that has, that's baked into the Affordable Care Act because, because now, um, starting in 2014, uh, health insurance companies will not be able to charge anyone a cost sharing uh, at the point of care for uh, preventive care. Um, and I, um, and then a, a, an aspect of wellness programs that is now really purely theoretical are, are these kind of behavioral economic helpers. Uh, uh, what can you do to get people to uh, take their medicine, stop smoking and drinking, and stay in drug treatment programs? And there's a whole, um, uh, you know, millions of dollars of research for people who want to do this kind of thing. So lots of universities are chasing uh, chasing after it. So, so what all of these programs have in common is the recruitment of healthcare financing organizations, employers, insurance companies, public insurance, to recruit individuals, as I said before, to govern themselves in a manner that reduces their claim on collective resources. And there's a lot of precursors to, to this. That, that er, there's earlier organized efforts by the states to, give, to get citizens to live more healthy lives. Um, education, of course, has been a focus, a place where uh, Children are, are are recruited, but the workplace as the uh, has also intermittently been a locus for public health efforts. And that the work environment is to adults, as the educational environment is to children. So we have um, the workplace recruited for public um, for social insurance programs. The work you know, they collect payroll taxes for social insurance, income taxes collected by employers, tax benefits for private social insurance expenses, and even the diffusion of civil rights through the are examples of efforts to use the workplace as a way to, um, to govern individuals. Um, and also insurance as a locus for uh, individual responsibility is something that we also find in the past, and I mentioned these uh, er earlier. Okay, so I've given you a very loose and qualitative sense of uh, wellness programs, keeping in mind that much is to be investigated. And one reason why so much remains to be investigated is that there's little or no research showing that these things actually work in the sense of making people healthier or reducing social costs. And so um, in thinking about this, I've started to believe that they actually do work in other ways and uh, suggested by my conversation with the C CEO. And so when I am thinking about this, I, I think about it, going around the idea of a two by two matrix, with one dimension being two different perspectives from which to consider the wellness programs, one the social planner, two the employer, insurer, risk bearing en entity, and then the other matrix is sort of aspirations and concerns. And I think looking at it conceptually this way, we can see what work they're doing. So the aspirations for, there's really three aspirations for uh, wellness programs from the social planner perspective. One is the obvious improve, improving the health of individuals. Uh, 
Second, reducing healthcare costs to society. And then the third is, the, is there being a more just distribution of health costs, responsibility-based healthcare pricing. And when you think about these three aspirations, you realize the first two are very consequentialist. They're, they point towards the achievement of concrete results in the world, and they're subject to empirical investigation and critique. The third uh, aspiration, more just distribution of health care, uh, is not a consequentialist. And it's more of a notion of justice. And so it isn't able to be demonstrated to be wrong or, or, or subject to a, an empirical critique, and that success isn't measured by healthiness or lower costs, but the achievement of the responsibility-based healthcare pricing is its own, uh, its own reward. And we know that, and this lines up with this idea of, of accountability and responsibility that is very strong values, if you just listen to our Republican candidates debating each other. Um, and so to the extent that wellness programs promote this, they're a success independent of whether they actually make people healthier or reduce claims on collective resources. Um, so, so that's the social planner perspective. Um, for the employer or insurer, the risk-bearing entity, um, their perspective on the consequentialist goals of individuals being healthy and the lower costs is similar, although for them, of course, the costs that they care about are not sort of grand social costs, but their own, own costs. Um, and that difference is important, I think, also in relation to this third social planner goal of having a more just distribution of health care. Uh, a rational employer or insurer doesn't care about those, but those ideas for their own end, but those ideas can be recruited to help them justify health plan designs that attract and retain desirable employees. So if I'm adopting a wellness program that is uh, socially acceptable in terms of its responsabilization of the individual and promoting sort of just approach to health care, if that happens to signal that I'm a progressive employer and that I care about my employees and if, that and if that encourages sort of active, healthy employees to sign up for me, uh, to, to work for me, or active, healthy employee, uh, people to join my insurance pool, um, then that promotes my uh, financial incentives. And you can see wellness programs is discouraging the irresponsible from joining or staying in the workforce. And very close to home for me, uh, the Penn hospitals have announced they're not going to hire anyone who smokes. Um, and the next step is that uh, you know people who I can only imagine what kind of wellness programs we're going to do for the employees that do smoke. Um, so um, so that is a uh, a sort of link between this sort of third aspirational uh, deontological non consequentialist and the self interest of employers and insurers. Um, from the there's huge concerns about wellness programs um, from a social planner perspective that they they. they under, they undermine risk, risk spreading, they promote, they stigmatize behavior that is, um, uh, you know, I mean, we might say it's fine to stigmatize smoking and alcohol, but sort of what's next? Uh, obesity, uh, with, and by the way, there's very little evidence that just being overweight in terms of the BMI is bad for you at all. Um, and, you know, and yet here we're gonna be going sort of st stigmatizing uh, People, I mean, I, uh, so, uh, so, and we have so stigmatization, coercion, loss of privacy. I, you know, I have to be in order to, that my, I'm going to do a health risk assessment so that my employer can find out about what it is my health status is, so that they can enroll me in this wellness program. And this year, I just have to do the, well, the, the health risk assessment. Next year, what do I have to do? And there's this image of a kind of ladder of compliance. Um, that, and um, so that's a, the concern from a social planner perspective. And in addition, there's a concern of waste. That, that are these things really going to work? Uh, and, uh, and that, and that uh, from, the, from the employer perspective, I would say that's the thing that they, they don't care about undermining risk spreading because stigmatization, coercion, loss of privacy, but they do worry about waste and about uh, members or employee satisfaction. And thinking about the sort of aspirations and the, and the concerns balanced together, at the moment, I think we are seeing all 
in the US at least, social planners, employers, insurers racing ahead, focused on the aspirations without much concern, with the small exception that employers don't want to make their employees too, their healthy employees too unhappy. Um, and my, my intuition, and I welcome ideas about how to investigate this, is that the appeal of the programs out there in the culture isn't really based on the consequentialist notions of individuals being healthier and reduce social health care costs, but really about wanting to have health plans that reward people for being uh, responsible uh, actors and, and agents you know, in the Nick Rose governing the soul sense. And I, and I do have one piece of evidence um, that comes from the current interest of the red, in the US you're familiar with the red states and the blue states, the red states, the Republicans, the blue states. The, but So the, um, the Affordable Care Act obligates or directs all states to have a health exchange that will be operating in, in 20, 2014 where individuals will be able to buy health insurance and get at, at a subsidized price. And um, the, there are huge incentives, so huge reasons why states want to do this. Um, Lots of federal money, um, they want to maintain their control. But if a state doesn't do it, the feds will do it for them. And so the red states are in the, un the governors in the red states are in a political bind right now. They don't want to do what's required to set up the health exchanges because that's seen as cooperating with Obamacare. But on the, on the other hand, there's these billions of federal dollars that are sitting on the table that they want to get. <laughs> and so um, what they are trying to come up with is how do they make their exchanges red? Uh, and <laughs> don't think red communism. <laughs> you know, how do they, and, and so a, it, a hot topic among the red states now is can we make our health exchanges make people engage in these wellness programs as a way of distinguishing them and making them politically uh, acceptable and emphasizing responsibility and accountability so that it's a, it's a you know, a Republican um, health exchange, not a Democrat one, and so therefore we get our cake and eat it too. We don't cooperate with Obamacare, but we get the billions of dollars of subsidies for our citizens who we actually probably really do want to have health insurance. We just don't want to take a political hit from the Tea Party for doing that. So, okay. <laughs> The time that we had agreed upon, very good. Okay, so um, now we will um, open it up to the floor. Yes, David. I, I, I appreciate your analysis and the, and the, the, uh, the research that you're continuing to develop on that. Um, sort of a comment, maybe you've got some follow-up on it. In, in the late 1980s, there was a very uh, I think one of, the, one of the most significant essays written about the meanings of, of health care and control. It was called The Health Nazis by Chuck Edgeley and Dennis Brissett, published in the journal Symbolic Interaction. And they pointed out that the Nazis were actually, reminded us, the Nazis were health fanatics. And they had you know, great, uh, a whole list of things, not only about purity of race and so forth, but purity of the body and physical stature and so forth, and they uh, developed a number of sanctions for people who didn't do these things, mm -hmm. and that the, the health Nazis, and they focused in part on smoking and obesity, that were very popular. Um, the, the article now was about what's going on in the United States, and, and the whole sense of social control, and that health was a morality mm -hmm. issue. Uh, and it was coded with different terms, responsibilities, and so forth. Setting up the legitimacy of more social control, um, closer parameters about uh, physical form and behavior, and not surprisingly, a lot of the things that were um, uh, prohibited or, or regarded as negative were things involving deviance, very traditional things, mm -hmm. drinking, smoking, sexual behavior, uh, you know, staying up late and so forth. <laughs> and, and so, and it, it's fascinating the role of insurance and everything. Right. And, wonder, and so, so I, I no, I want to. I, I mean, I, I obviously have to look at that. But um, I really right. see the things that you're, you're talking about is really expand, expanding this, and it's, it's a kind of discourse that we don't talk about much. It's, it's good to be healthy, but you know the consequences of that. I wonder if you just have any. Yeah. No. I mean, I just. I mean the. 
the recruitment of health as another area for moral engagement, and and that the you know that, you know why does the tea you know how, how do you like link the Tea Party back to healthcare and and. You know, I, and, and I think about again. I think about the situation of the of the governor, which is the governor you know, is kind of kind of a social planner, but the guy has to get reelected, and so he 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 you know. And there's a you know, and many of this red states are states that have huge health problems, love poor access to care, so so they want to do this, but they can't do it in a way that is seen as cooperating, and so. Engaging in you know sort of health, they couldn't probably call themselves the health Nazis, but no, but but this idea of of, of making it into a moral thing and 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 you know and and the Arizona, well, you know the Arizona um, making the Medicaid people pay fifty dollars. I mean that's not about it's not, it's not about revenue raising. It's not about anything. It's about you know you you know deadbeat poor person. What are you doing smoking and taking our tax dollars, right? Yeah. <laughs> Tom? Can you say more about the, um, the mobilization of scientific data behind a lot of this? Because you, you mainly focused on like financial, moral, political discourses. But then you mentioned this BMI and how that doesn't even necessarily correlate. Like the obesity doesn't necessarily correlate with health or the other things that we might assume it does. And the same with the you know, with the smoking or something. How do they use the, the scientific data on all this stuff, the, the different players and stakeholders in there? The, um, there, uh, there is a very little research that it actually works. There's a team at, Penn has a uh, behavioral health group that's really a cutting edge group there, and so they're trying to figure out how do you get people to take their medication, stop smoking, um, and it, it is incredibly difficult to even get people to keep taking their medicine. Um, which is, if, if, if you think about it, if you can't get people to keep taking their medicine, which you know, doesn't hurt them while they're taking it, it, it it's not, you know, it's, it's just a pain, but it's not like giving up something, it's not like quitting smoking or quitting, quitting drinking. Um, and, but you know, so the people have different, there's you know research that goes on. I'm sure it's like criminological research. Where, you know, they'll try with the radio ba the transmitters with with pill caps that that send a signal when you put the, take the cap off and um, and so what what little research there is is touted, but 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 mostly it's it is just this is the right thing to do. Aaron, yeah, no, this is super interesting. To our talk, so, so thanks very much. I'm I'm always really fascinated by. Uh, sort of, there's the debate between actuarial, actuarial fairness on the one hand, where insurance companies should be able to price just on the basis of risk completely, and that's fair. And then on the other hand, there's the solidarity principle where people, everybody should pay the same. And then there's kind of a middle ground where uh, you can justify pricing on some kind of criteria, but the justifications for risk rating are seldom actually articulated, and, uh, and also the sort of um, what the principles those are based on. So, so people will make, uh, like in Europe, there's been this judgment that um, it's discriminatory to make men pay for more, pay, pay more for auto insurance than women. And so there's an implicit thing going on there that it's not their fault that men have worse driving records <laughs> and women have some kind of biological imperative, you know. And, 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 <laughs> um, and, and so, so I'm sort of fascinated by what uh, kind of implicit principles you might draw out, you know, in relation to health and what I would say about particular things about, you know, what is people's responsibility. So clearly, like we've heard, like smoking, uh, keeping your weight down, assessing your risk, and does it extend to other things which are now seen as people's sort of moral obligation, like exercise? Is right. I mean, it, the Affordable Care Act is a fascinating document in many ways, and it explicitly lists what you can and cannot use as the basis for ch different prices. And the fact, the only four factors that you can use are age, and but no more than three to one. You can use geography, where where you are, because the health practices and costs vary from region. You can use whether it's an individual or family, and you can use smoking. 
So smoking, and you can charge a smoker one and a half times as much as you can charge a non-smoker. And then the fifth, which is not explicitly a risk classification mechanism, is these wellness. There's, the, those are the only, I mean, there's really only five bases upon which, well, plus six, I guess, you, what, whatever the, pan, there's different levels of plans. There's gold, silver, platinum, you know, you can charge a, for more for a platinum plan than for a bronze plan. But, um, but so, so anything that fits under the umbrella of wellness, so you could charge more for some, well, you wouldn't be, you're not allowed to charge more for someone who doesn't exercise, but what you do is you give a discount to someone who does. Um, and so, so the action is going to be in the design of these wellness programs, and, and can they be designed from the, you know, from the, insh from in, a, in a world in which people get to choose their health insurance, then there's powerful incentive on the part of the people designing the plans to design them in a way so that the people who choose to buy them are the low risk people. Uh, and so that will be the way that these wellness plans, I think, will be used. Yes, Pat? Just a comment, I was, as you were talking about this, I was thinking about the 19th century, the, the way this resurrects 19th century practices of employers that, you know, an employer would not employ any man who is a smoker or a drinker. Drink. Mm -hmm. Not because of health issues at all, but because of what it indicated about that type of person that weren't trustworthy, or they weren't disciplined, um, or a whole array of other, a whole constellation of moral attributes. Quite right, too. That this, 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 in other words, I, I'm interested to the extent, extent to which you think this is being re-registered, but that there's a much broader sense of a moral person than a well person being invoked. Although, the, I mean, what, what I thought what makes it so complicated is that, is that they will, at the same time that the programs are kind of racing ahead based on this moralization, when you ask people, you know, other than this CEO who I play squash with, and so therefore he was sort of open to me about it, they'll say they're doing it to make their employees healthier and to reduce health care costs. And so, so and, and, and if, you know, and it makes sense, right? Doesn't it make sense that if people take care of themselves that they're gonna be healthier and that's gonna be lower costs for society as a whole? Um, and, you know, so it's, we, you know, we believe that at the same time that we also are engaged in identifying people as being deviant or not and charging them different prices. Thank you, Tom. Yeah.